a blowout jobs report from the United States is sending investor confidence soaring, with pundits crying that hedge funds were wrong, the markets were right all along. Meanwhile, Bitcoin wobbles in indecisions, altcoins accelerate, Grayscale gets bullish, and Goldman Sachs gets absolutely pwned. All this and more in today's exciting episode of Breaking Bitcoin. Hi, this is Brian Kerr from Kava Labs. You're watching Breaking Bitcoin. Welcome back to Breaking Bitcoin. This is your daily source for everything cryptocurrency markets and personal finance. Hopefully, everyone is doing fantastic on this lovely Friday, wherever you happen to be and however you are tuning into us this afternoon. We've got a lot to talk about before we begin. Today's show is, of course, brought to you by the Cracking Cryptocurrency premium trading group. There has never been a better time to learn how to navigate the financial markets. Doesn't matter whether you're interested in cryptocurrency, forex, stocks, derivatives, the premium trading group certainly has you covered. You can join our community of professional traders and learn how to build your own objective data-driven strategy. If you're tired of trading with your gut, or if you've seen poor discipline in trade management, sap away your success, make the change and join us at premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com. That's premium dot cracking cryptocurrency.com like i said we've got so much to talk about today obviously who can overstate the the obvious stock market soaring uh and it's at times like these and the title of today's show is of course uh you know who ordered some froth i can only describe the feeling in traditional equity markets and stock trading circles as insanely frothy you know Periods like this do not come around that often, where you have this high, high capacity to be so right uh, and so wrong uh, with your directional bias and your timing uh, in the market. The overall sentiment, and this is from talking to seasoned traders, to investors, to individuals that work uh, in the financial department, they don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> Nobody knows. Nobody knows what the hell's going on. Uh, and it's so amazing. Meanwhile, over in cryptocurrency land, I think that things are pretty simple. I think that long-term fundamentals uh, are playing out quite nicely. We've got a lot of things up and coming. And overall, I continue to see the push, particularly from individuals that aren't um, the savviest, but that do represent wealth, continuing to talk about their increased interest in Bitcoin, gold, and silver, which are hard money. Uh, in the in the face of everything that's going on in the world, depending on doesn't really matter on what nation you're in. This is a global event uh, and everything's sort of tied together. So uh, all that aside, all I can say out there is be safe. And before you make any significant decisions, particularly with your uh, portfolio or with your long term holdings or your long term investments, or your long term wealth, uh, do not do anything impulsively. Certainly do not do anything that is compelling you to do so or inspiring you to do so based off of mainstream media or any tweet any any like individual data point that you see when it comes to these decisions you really want to step back take a hop comprehensive approach do your own research and make the decision that ultimately you're going to be happy with moving forward because when it comes to critical investment decisions and timing you're often not going to nail the absolute moment you're going to have to be comfortable with being wrong for a while before you're right and um, yeah an important lesson to carry forward so before with that being said uh, let's hop if you guys have any questions if you have any questions, make sure to drop them in the live chat. The moderators will direct my attention to them. We're going to talk about a whole lot. Let's get right into the cryptocurrency markets. Then we'll look at traditional markets. We'll look at Forex. Uh, we'll look at CFDs and look at what we're going to be doing on this beautiful Friday, which is generally profit taking day for us. So let's take a gander. Oh, what's going on? All right, here we are in the live scene. We made it. Okay, so um, Pull open our daily here. Uh, actually, before we do that, let's actually just kind of hop down to the uh, 45 minute time frame and we'll talk about this. Uh, so, you know, as we look at today's trading session, uh, you know, again, it seems like there is never much new under the sun. Uh, you know, today's trading session, Bitcoin consolidated for the most part during last night's Asian session. You know, we attempted to break out. We attempted to break, uh, you know, we attempted to break out. We attempted to break below. Uh, Hold on a second, actually. 
let me get that. Okay, cool. All right, anyways. Um, all right, so uh, as we kind of come into the market this morning, uh, coming off of heavy sell side pressure, and again, we see absorption where we see absorption at today's daily point of control. Um, okay. So this is what I see. This is what I saw coming into the morning, coming down to my desk. The first thing I was looking at again, let's actually start off. Yeah, I apologize. Let's actually start off on the daily and just walk through this. We'll look at two potential systems here. And this is kind of what I was obviously what I was talking about last night with individuals and you know what I basically alluded, not alluded to, but this is exactly what I said yesterday. Uh, things are beginning to look more positive than bearish, certainly on the daily, but there's just no justifications yet for daily swing trades, which is my bread and butter trade, right? I wait for confirmation. I wait for all of my indicators to be confirming of a particular directional bias. And then I take that, I take that signal and I trade in that direction with managed risk. Now uh, on the daily, we certainly do not have that. So looking at the breaking Bitcoin primary system, we are testing the daily baseline, the whole moving average 60. Uh, we are currently below it right now, but we do have potential to close above it. Parallax, which is our kind of averaged smooth momentum oscillator did actually hold its bullish position so it is still in bullish territory so confirming long trades to the upside should we get the impetus to take that trade uh minx which did actually end up giving a sell signal is looking to cross back over so our more sensitive momentum oscillator is hinting at crossing back up to the upside which would be a continuation long assuming that we're above the baseline our volatility indicator water tar explosion is showing us rising uh, rising explosion levels. So the Bollinger Bands are separating, indicating that we are going to be seeing or that we have a high propensity to continue to see increased volatility in the market, which is good if your directional bias is correct. We're also above the breaking Bitcoin initiator. So that level has now been not significantly updated. It's still sitting at 95.05, uh, as I talked about in this morning's market analysis. Although overall uh, swing low support or range lows still rest at about 9,300. We'll see that in more detail as we zoom in. Uh, if the daily were to close below 9505, I would feel that this structure has largely broken to the downside from a technical perspective, and that would be a good impetus to actually be looking for short positions rather than long positions. Right now, it seems that the indicators and what the market is attempting to do is get us geared for a long. However, if if volume if sell side order flow takes control and buyers stop bidding up this area, even though they have continued to do so, we haven't seen price nuke yet. If that changes, though, as price can often do on a dime, then we need to be prepared for that. And again, I think the level to watch is that $9,500 level. Still moving forward, no swing positions for me so far, and I don't see any forming today unless something drastic happens. What, what that drastic could be is if price were to rally, close all the way above 9810, 9900, and if minks were to go ahead and cross to the upside, then those would be potentially things we'd be looking at for continuation. Swing longs to the upside, targeting the $11,000 to $12,000 area. Initially, uh, finer detail on those take profit targets would be posted to the members if we decide to take that trade. Uh, looking at, not this one, yep, this one right here. I wanted to show you guys this. Uh, I've been talking about this for uh, probably the last few days, kind of an alternative or more public PTP system, one that can be accomplished with more, um, one that can be accomplished with general trading view indicators. Uh, of course, all PTP systems can be accomplished, but I just like to show different examples of good systems, like nice, robust systems that give good objective trading signals, particularly on the daily. Uh, what we're seeing here is a little interesting. Obviously, we've gone through this before, but just for the benefit of those who are joining us or haven't been paying attention, because of course, both things are equally possible. Uh, we have the time transformation as the initiator, TSI as the, confirm, uh, as the confirmer, uh, and money flow, dynamic money flow in this case, as the uh, vol filter. Uh, and this is a uh, Donchian 26. So uh, we are actually above this, but uh, kind of the same thing here. And this fits just in line with that um, breaking Bitcoin primary system, which is what I utilize. So what I really like about this is that although here we can see that our vol filter and our baseline are confirming upside, we do not have the crossover on time transformation, which is one of our proprietary indicators, which would be a continuation or a long signal under any metric. Uh, and we also do not have, as we can see, true, th true strength index crossed over its signal line. So it is not confirming long trades. Now, as we can see, TSI is actually getting very close to its signal line. And if we can get some positive momentum in here, a nice, good, strong candle body close on good volume, 
then I would assume that we would get both signals simultaneously. We would be closing above the Hall moving average 60. We would also be crossing over on time transformation. We would be crossing over on true strength index. So a lot of good fodder in there, a lot of good potential indicators, a lot of good potential signals for those swing long confirmation trades. But not yet, not yet. So as long as that is the case, no swing longs for me, which means if we're going to take speculative risk, we're going to go down to the lower time frames. And overall, it's a profitable area to trade. Your directional bias has to be correct. Your risk tolerance has to be correct. And your risk management has to be on point. Remember, if we're going to descend to lower time frames and rely on other metrics. So let's do that. All right. So starting off on the four hour time frame, again, uh, relatively choppy. The initial four hour long signal here has generated profit for us, obviously utilizing Quadrigo. I know that we have hit at least TP1 on that particular trade. Uh, most likely, depending on where your stop is, of course, you would have been wicked out at break even potentially on this movement to the downside. However, still a profitable setup. Uh, as we can see, Minx did end up crossing over and so has a reset. However, we remain above the zero line, even down here on the four hour, and we look to be heading back up for another crossover, which would be another continuation long. So uh, in any other words, things are looking more like continuation uh, longs or at least longs intraday uh, on both the meso time frames and on the lower time frames as we get down into that. So bullish sentiment coming out here, albeit not uh, the strongest particular signal. Uh, over here on the 45 minute time frame, uh, we have my ISIS spot strategy and we also have the BitMEX funding and premium index from Neobutane. Uh, so, uh, again, what do we see kind of coming into this morning's trading session from the micro perspective here? Uh, fairly heavy sell-off after this kind of screw you candle down to what became today's area of consolidation, today's point of control. Uh, but we see this at about 3.15 in the morning, my time. Uh, we see price move to the upside on a strong candle body close after a pretty screw you wick to the downside. Bought back up. I remember I was uh, actually no, I was certainly asleep for that. Uh, and then price uh, sold all the way down to the $9680, $9,600 level. Actually, didn't we get all the way down to 9600 I think the lows was $9,630. Uh, and we consolidated here for quite a while, for the course of about six hours. And we look to be pushing off from today's point of control to the upside right now. Uh, now, I am in... Uh, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, ISIS spot generating a buy signal here in oversold territory, which was my impetus for my initial long. I've actually taken, uh, I've actually taken three trades today already. I am currently in two of them. Uh, what's the name of the ticker that is 2x spy short? That is going to be SDS, sir. Pro shares, SDS, ultra short. Go Hawks. Um, so. Uh, what becomes our area of contention? What becomes the area of support for bulls to hold? Where have position buyers entered into the market at today's point of control at 96.75? And also we see absorption, uh, sell side absorption from buyers in the lower $9,600 area. However, certainly after the consolidation, after the absorption, after the position buyers, uh, the level to watch to break would be that 96.75. This is the Bybit chart, so please adjust uh, to your local market structure if you're trading on BitMEX or Deribit or FTX or Femex or whatever have you. Uh, now, uh, we still have the kind of $10,100, $10,200 area. That is an untested point of control, likely profit-taking area. I'm actually going to be a little bit more conservative because I am going to be taking advantage of long movements if we end up, uh, I am in long exposure. So if we do end up rallying to the upside here and approaching the $10,000 area, I'm going to go ahead and be conservative and pull out around the $9,900 area. And then I will be watching those kind of higher time frames for those. Uh, I'll be in a daily swing long at that point, most likely. Um, uh, either on on Friday or Saturday, there'll be the impetus there for me to actually enter into that daily swing long. And I won't need to look at anything like market structure or horizontal support and resistance, but we will look at those things if you prefer to have that kind of confluence in your analysis, which is totally fine. Uh, don't need it, but it can help sometimes. Uh, looking at overall sentiment in the market, we can see that uh, not ridiculously high, but there was premium on BitMEX or derivatives price, meaning that there was uh, heavy retail buying at these levels. And of course, what happened? Price moved to the downside, generally as soon as that started happening. And what do we see right here? Uh, and what actually gives me a little bit more um, belief that we are going to continue to move to the upside here seems more likely than, than further downside pressure uh, is this backwardation on price. 
is back rotation on BitMEX price relative to spot price, indicating that uh, individuals are attempting to sell this level, did attempt to sell this level, and are attempting to sell on the way up, meaning that not only do we have positioned buyers at this level, we also have positioned sellers. They're trap sellers. So individuals, individuals that attempted to short this kind of local range low, uh, they're positioned sellers now, and they're in drawdown. And we are approaching their liquidation or take profit price. And again, if that starts to happen, we reach that level where lots of shorts that shorted that area get liquidated. That causes acceleration of price, cascading liquidations, uh, incentivizes price to the upside. And then if you're a bull, you hope that you also get FOMO buying at that point in time, breakout buying that is actually sustained uh, and that uh, strong sell side order flow doesn't step in because that might not be able to sustain that. If you see, it's kind of like um, standing in front of a rampaging uh, you know, herd of bulls, right? Um, if you don't have the power to deflect them, even if you want to, uh, it's best for you to get out of the way, right? Because why would you sell at lower prices if you know the bulls are likely to bid price up to a higher level that you can sell at? So overall, uh, levels to watch today are going to be the break of 96.75. Otherwise, I think that uh, most things seem to be pointing to the upside so far. Getting a little bit lower here. Uh, getting a low, little bit lower here. Uh, again, and you can see this a little bit more clearly here uh, as we kind of zoom in all throughout this area. Uh, let's kind of just just kind of zoom back. Again, this is this is our, our large move to the downside after the break above 10,000 and then the movement right back down those two daily candles of uh, chop. Uh, and then we basically just rise to the upside on not very convincing premium or backwardation. I would say certainly more heavy to the backwardation here. Uh, as we can see, price is rising on backwardation. Look where the yellow bars are. They are below the zero line here. That means that there is more aggressive selling like there's <laughs> there's there's backwardation on price. Um, and then, of course, as soon as price we enter premium, price moves down. Uh, so all these longs, position longs, retail longs get liquidated. Uh, price moves up again on what? What does price move rapidly up on? Backwardation until we reach what? This distribution level, which I hinted at, looked distributive to me yesterday, where we get massive premium. So a lot of position buyers entered in here. And what do we get? Large move to the downside to fake them out. Uh, a lot of those individuals, a lot of longs here have been smoked, exited their positions, liquidated. Then we have, what do we have here? We have a seller's positioning. Just over and over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, so certainly sentiment analysis, um, uh, but very, very, very effective if you're going to be utilizing these time frames. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the way I particularly played it this morning, uh, my first initial trade this morning was too early. Uh, the first trade that I took uh, I actually took a bracketed pair of trades, uh, which was successful for me yesterday as well. I did the exact same thing yesterday. I was able to, uh, I had entered at 9,500 uh, two days ago for the long, and then I ended, uh, I, I, I put on more risk to the long at 9,600. Uh, price ended up running up to the, around the $9,700 areas, filling my take profit. Price pulled down a little bit, and I exited at an updated break even around the 9,630 level. Uh, so I was, I was, uh, I was out in profit, um, as of actually this morning, because that, that long ended up pulling down to my take profit. Uh, so I ended up putting on a initial long this morning, uh, was too conservative with my stop loss and got stopped out on that trade, uh, and also set a bracketed short order that actually filled, and kind of the worst possible thing that can happen happened, right? Well, you know, there's ways to deal with this. You just have to get more complex with your bracketing than if this happens, if you really want to avoid it. But, you know, assume, like, let me walk you guys through this, right? So assuming, you know, price was is roughly right around here, and, you know, you take a long for whatever reason right around here and you're looking for price to go to the upside and you set a stop loss on your long and like maybe right above your stop loss, you set a conditional order to go short uh, to be able to play the breakdown to the upside. So what you have to do now, at least on BTC USDT, because you cannot yet set conditional stop orders, you have to wait until the position is open and then set it with, you know, manually with a position, which is an update I know that they're working on. Uh, but this is the way that I did it as well. So entered long, looking for a breakout, set my stop loss a little too conservatively, and set my short order to trigger as well. Uh, so once that happened, uh, and, I, and we were around this area, I, of course, set a stop loss for my shorts. is actually a little bit higher. It's like right around here. Um, and just did nothing, right? W w looking to see if we are going to end up breaking down. Uh, then of course I see this, uh, kind of pre or excuse me, backwardation on price start to form. I see price beginning to move up more aggressively. Uh, and so I want to protect myself now again. So what do I, what do I now do? I actually market entered. I market entered into another long set my stop loss pretty much in the same place, right? Because it's already been wicked once. If it goes down there again, I'm either unlucky or market structure really wants to move down. And these are the risks that you have to take, as I said. 
uh, when you're sometimes looking for a good entry. It's throwing a jab and throwing a jab and throwing a jab, and you just have to make sure that if you're going to do this, you need to be position sizing consistently so that when you do get your winning pair, um, it makes up for the losses that you took to get there, right? It, the, the juice has to be worth the squeeze, right? Uh, and it, you know, again, nothing is guaranteed. You can, of course, set more and more complicated bracketed orders, but the more that you do that, the more complicated your trade becomes to manage, which is generally not how I like to trade in the first place. I just had excess time and have had excess time to trade more aggressively lately. And uh, uh, it's not guaranteed to win, but it does give you a higher probability or greater control. Um, so anyways, uh, the way that this had, the, anyways, the way that I actually structured this uh, and the way that this went down was my initial short got stopped out. I got filled on my short. Price started rising up. That's the worst possible thing that could happen. You could think. So now I need to protect myself again. So uh, entering long for the same uh, position size that I have on the short. So now I'm essentially flat with the drawdown from the entry of the short up to the area where I entered the long. And then I have my stop loss for my short. And what do I do? I set a conditional market order to pick up more long exposure. It is That's the way you kind of have to scale into a further position once it's going in your position is a more effective way to um, ensure that when you have the successful leg of the trade and you've dumped the losing leg of the trade, uh, that the profit, that the P&L at the end of the day makes up for the jabs that you had to throw and that you can accomplish your original profit target, right? Or your original profit goal, whether you're shooting for $100 a day or $30 a day, which by the way, guys, remember that $30 a day is about 10 grand a year, right? So if you can accomplish $30 a day, which is doable, uh, you have a very respectable side income hustle. Uh, but that's about it. That's about it. So... And we can see backwardation on price increasing as price moves to the upside. Not a lot here that looks too bearish at this point in time, unless we see strong sell side order flow come in. Okay. So that's where we're at with today's price action and what I'm overall looking at. Uh, if we look to the spy, I mean, we have gone full on nuclear right here. Um, and for those of you who don't know, obviously, the uh, United States issued uh, an important economic benchmark today is the jobs report. Uh, and it stands in complete contrast to what generally everyone was expecting. Uh, over 2 million jobs created uh, in, in the, the last month. So, uh, of course, remember, this data is backdated one month. But just um, don't really have a lot of words about it, right? You know, you um, you, you can, on one hand, you can say... On one hand, you can say, right, that, hey, the market was right. Humans were wrong because humans are fearful and short-sighted and simple and greedy and they get afraid and they let their emotions kind of affect their sentiment naturally. And the market was right. And the market was bid up naturally because the market is just the sum of individuals speculating and participating in the market. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Uh, what I can certainly say from my perspective is that the market certainly feels frothy right now. Um, I'm happy with the profits that I, uh, you know, I had very good trades in, in SPLG and, and SPX, which I actually ended up exiting yesterday. So I didn't have a whole lot of long exposure. Actually, I did. I put on three new, uh, I, I went long on the ag agricultural industry yesterday. Uh, in both ETF and CFD format. So that's actually doing pretty well today. But um, this is a really contentious and frothy area. On one hand, since I only trade the daily with the, the ETF market, there's really nothing for me to do, which keeps me safe and protected because I feel that a lot of people are going to get burned at these levels. Um, either way the market goes, right? The either, you know, I think the hedge funds are right and they're going to take advantage of this froth because if you just zoom out, uh, we'll get to this when we look at the SPY ETF, but certainly if you just zoom out, I mean, you are not ill positioned. Like if you held through the entire movement down and you, and you've held through the entire movement back up, you've essentially received a gift to sell basically at the valuation of your stocks as they were, you know, looking at my overall stock portfolio, it, my, my nav has uh, essentially completely recovered. And that's not to, that's not to account for the growth that it's had over the last decade. So this is something that I'm personally considering myself moving forward and, and uh, that I'll have to consider over the weekend. But it's, it's an interesting, interesting point in time where 
you have to stick to your guns about the decision that you want to make. Either you fundamentally believe, because here's what I don't think that people were, were well intended to doing. When the market crashed, I know a lot of people sold. And I've seen a lot of posts on Reddit like this and in Twitter, right? Uh, individuals are sold at the lows and then price went back up relatively to the areas where the traditional markets are valued now. And they're saying that they bought back in, right? They drew a line in the sand. They said, if the market comes back up to where it was, I'm going to buy back in. They've done that. And you, I mean, it's just things like that that make me think, man, this is good signs that, that, that a local top might be in, right? Now, I don't know. I will wait until the market is confirmed by breaking down below their respective baselines and showing their respective indicators to be bearish before I trade in the direction of the trend again, as I did with the previous market crash, utilizing uh, SH and SDS, and actually toward the last leg of the market, SPXU, uh, to, uh, because I had less capital to allocate because I had it tied up in larger trades. So, frothy. Be careful out there. All right. Um, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail when we actually look at the ETF. Looking at the Bitcoin CME markets, traditional metrics here, we are still below the daily baseline. Traditional CMEs want to see price above 10,105 to be looking for swing longs. So definitely something to watch. Let's see if we, let's see what activity we get over the weekend. And this will be kind of the market to watch maybe for the gap fill. So for those of you who choose to do nothing, right? One thing that you could potentially do is if we end up rallying over the weekend, gaps tend to get filled. Uh, you could look for that gap fill for the potential area to be re-entered into long continuation, right? One particular strategy. And we'll come back to that here in a little bit. All right, uh, looking at the broader cryptocurrency market today, show me what you got, crypto bubbles. Uh, Wax P, which I do believe is the ultimate, ultimate pump and dump coin. Uh, up another like 9,000%. I don't know, the thing's up like 9,000 uh, like every single day. Um, still never traded it. Zilliqua, doing well. ICX, Celsius, Atom. These are all against BTC. Uh, Lisk, uh, Cheez-Its. Yeah, Cheez-Its. I love Cheez-Its. Chilies. Uh, Nano, Komodo, SNX, Ren, uh, IOST, Hive. Uh, all doing pretty well. Uh, big performers over the last few days, getting a little bit of a pullback. For example, I see um, uh, block stacks down about 3.4%. Loop ring down about 10%. Electronium down 6.7%. Electronium's a scam anyway. So, uh, excuse me. Uh, but overall, pretty actually decent day in the market. Certainly more gains than losses. I know that uh, I was talking with senior analyst Alexander, who is, uh, again, still pretty heavily weighted in all coins, as I am myself. And uh, yeah, I think he's going to be incredibly wealthy when he ends up cashing out all of his trades. It is... Uh, uh, yeah, it is. Uh, it, it's pretty ridiculous. He is up over 100% on open, uh, open PNL. I think it's maybe over 150%. I'll have to check, but absolutely crushing it. Um, all right, let's take a look at let's take a look at uh, classic TA here, and we'll look at levels for you level guys. Uh, uh, really, nothing too exciting here. Uh, Bitcoin did hold the 20 daily moving average, which is the middle line of the Bollinger Band, and RSI is technically here in um, uh, bullish control zone, being above 50, 55.99, and I'm just kind of listing lazily. I don't really see anything perspective or, or important here. Um, you know, we are trending up toward resistance, which is something that I do like to see. Again, consolidation at resistance is generally a bullish thing. That consolidation is occurring at a long-term trend line that, you know, I feel like I started talking about two weeks ago and now everybody's talking about it, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not attributing cause and effect. I'm not that popular. Uh, it's just, you know, something that's, that's obvious people, individuals, like, since I'm not a big line guy, I just point, I just started pointing this stuff out because it's interesting to talk about. Um, and most everybody else is just a lines guy. Like lines are just it. Lines are the only thing in the market uh, where really it's like indicators and momentum, in my opinion. Uh, it's, they, they constantly need to, to shift the narrative to what the next like support or resistance level is on the market, right? Support and resistance is a thing, um, but it's not always a thing. Like levels do exist, but it depends on it depends on the nature of the approach to support and resistance for you to make somewhat of an accurate prediction about what is likely to happen. Um, yeah, Don Candon calling out that infamous two girls, one cup pattern. Uh, so we obviously have this diagonal trend line, and I don't like diagonal trend lines, but 
you know, again, they, they're not not a thing. They're just not really a thing. Uh, that stretches down from the two, uh, marks the top of the 2017 bull market, 2019 bull market, 2020 bull market. Uh, ah. And we are approaching and consolidating at that level in a way that I don't think that we really have before. I mean, just look at um, uh, uh, just look at market structure at the 2017 highs, pretty uh, swift rejection and uh, V bottom back up and swift rejection. Uh, if we look at the 2019, very similar V bottom rejection or excuse me, uh, you know, V top rejection, V bottom ra uh, rally and then immediate rejection uh, and then, you know, no, no real consolidation here close to that level. Uh, same in, um, uh, this is February, 2020, pretty swift rejection. Uh, if we look at what we're seeing here, this is completely different, right? This is straight consolidation, ranging behavior at that resistance level, uh, forming a good level of support again, right around the $8,600 area on daily swing basis. And now kind of driving back up to that level, driving back up to the level on rising open interest. We talked about CME call options, trading at strike prices of 11 to 13,000 with, with a volume of $120 million yesterday. This is very, very bullish, honestly. Um, really, from my perspective. Uh, and more important horizontal level, in my opinion, is the 10,200, which really marks the top of the high volume node on the volume profile, which I think is significant. And 10,300 actually forms a horizontal support uh, or excuse me, resistance level, which I do think that if we're going to talk about lines, horizontal levels matter far more than diagonal levels do. I'm not sure diagonal levels are really a thing. At least I don't really trade off of them because I just don't have a lot of success with them. Horizontal levels can be important if you know what to watch for, and they can add confidence and conviction to your trading decisions. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I think my narrative on this has been... Uh, I think my narrative on this has been pretty clear and it seems like the rest of the markets is pretty clear you usually don't want to be on the side of everybody in the market but there's times when you do because the hurting effect is a real thing and thing some things seem to be fairly obvious uh so ten thousand remains an important level to watch for the breakage of pick your line ten thousand two hundred ten thousand three hundred ten thousand one it just doesn't really matter right <laughs> if it's the dotted line Price will just go through the gap. No line whatsoever. Um, and for reference, here is that uh, weekly chart and volume profile analysis. Again, nothing really deterministic as far as weekly candle structure goes. It's not closed yet. We'll talk about it on Monday. So far, shaping up to be really not much. This isn't a rejection candle. Wick to the upside. I consider these fairly neutral. Um. Yeah, I don't really have much else to say besides that. Okay, let's go to our uh, example PTP system here, and let's kind of take a look at the major markets here real quick, and then we'll get into today's news. Uh, Bybit, so Ethereum, USD, nothing to do here. We see a uh, we see true strength index confirming bullishness. We are above the baseline. Uh, time transformation has, however, crossed under. We would require a cross back over in time transformation or initiator signal of your choice. Insert here uh, for an actual long signal. Uh, money flow remains positive. Optimum entry level is going to be below 233. Uh, excuse me, 234. Let's round it up. Uh, but above 220. Let's round that up as well. So this area right here between the qualifying line and the baseline would be good areas. Trend wouldn't flip bearish here until about 219.90. All right, so nothing to do on Ethereum, no continuation. We've been consolidating. EOS USD not looking too bad, giving a potential continuation signal. Again, money flow, time transformation, true strength baseline, all quite bullish here. So again, uh, pretty extended candle, but again, uh, looking like an actual decent continuation if we're going to see positive USD movements and perhaps an early hinter. There is a little bit more... Um, uh, if, you know, looking at XRP, XRP generally sucks to trade. Ethereum has its own thing going on. Bitcoin is Bitcoin. And EOS at least has some separate fundamentals going on from that. But again, as I've said many, many times, 99% of the time, eh, like 90, 90 to 95% of the time, uh, the major USD and USDT markets appear to be completely correlated. Uh, XRP, USD, I, I, I don't want anything to do with this. Uh, you know, TSI bullish. EMF bullish, uh, time transformation cross down. So if it were to give a crossover here, it'd actually be a good entry area. Uh, but you guys know how I feel about XRP. Uh, and so far, the chart isn't signaling bullish. I take long trades on XRP when they signal for them. It's not signaling right now. Nothing to say. Moving on. Uh, and 
That's about it. That's the majors on Bybit. Uh, as I said, overall, altcoin market structure is looking good. Uh, market capitalization is looking good. Let's take a look at our ETF indices. Uh, we'll start off with the DIA ETF. Uh, very nice gap to the upside today. Again, explosive movement out of the uh, out of traditional markets today. Absolutely could have gap captured more profit on my SPY trades if it would have held open, but I felt yesterday was a good profit-taking area because I'd been in for almost a week already. Uh, so really nothing to do here on the DIA. Uh, all things look relatively bullish here, and we would have to wait for an exit signal. Keep in mind, uh, time transformation is indicating that we're getting into quite frothy areas here on the daily. Uh, looking at the triple Qs. Oh, after that initial rejection and I said I didn't want to do anything, we are breaking above that level. Now we are above 240. Now we are above 240. Now I need to be a man of my word and watch to see what happens on Monday if I'm going to be looking for continuation longs on uh, the Qs. So I will keep you guys updated on that. But again, classic way that we would look at this, taking fundamentals kind of out of the picture. Blue sky breakout generally always leads to new all-time highs. And we technically have a new all-time high in the market right now, but you guys know what I mean. Acceleration, continuation. And looking at the spy. Looking at the spy, the spy looks like the DIA. Again, having a nice gap to the upside here. I don't think or believe it's warranted for continuation. So you should apply that, in my thinking anyways, the way I'm applying that is to the cues as well, right? Uh, I will take the continuation signal. We're in overbought territory that generally discludes continuation signals for me. If we were to come back down out of the overbought territory and then cross back over, that would be the entry signal, I believe, for these markets if we are going to continue onwards to the upside, which is probably more likely at this point in time, in the short term, at least. Blue sky breakouts, particularly in the NASDAQ, not something to ignore. All right, uh, let's look at mine. Uh, my trades, DBA ETF. Actually, um, I don't believe I did, uh, but I actually haven't checked my brokerage this morning. No, no way. Yeah, no. Nowhere near our first take profit on DBA. Uh, also took long on corn. Also went long on wheat, which has gone contrary. Nice pullback to the baseline right here. But again, we'll hold this open. Two winners, one loser so far. As far as my recent entries, uh, aluminum actually putting in something yesterday. Nothing to really say, nothing to really do. Uh, in good profits on my aluminum swing. And tin. Uh, words. Words are good. Long on tin. And getting a beautiful, beautiful gap to the upside on today's open. Nice rebalance of about 5.46% more profit on that to the upside. Yay, tin. Uh, that's about all I have to say about that. Nothing really else on my watch list yet at this point in time, except for nickel. Uh, waiting for nickel to kind of pull back a little bit. Can only, only hope. But um, And then overall, metal sub-index having a nice day as well. I think mostly pushed up by 10, which is seeing increased demand. Uh, LD is something that I'd watch as well. Lead having a good day as well. Uh, looking at our CFDs and looking at our precious metals today. Again, gold, unfortunately not having a good day uh, we are actually breaking down now below the baseline dmf is not there so not confirming a short uh, with this particular system we do need to be more patient and not kind of take this initial swing on gold at least that's what this system would be indicating for uh, and actually wait for money flow to turn negative and actually see continued sustained bearishness before we'd be looking to short something like gold uh palladium being pretty i believe the technical term here is fucky <laughs> Uh, so I, I don't feel there's anything to do on Palladium at this point in time. Uh, silver as well. We are back, pulled all the way back to the baseline now on uh, silver. So if we were to get a nice cross to the upside, uh, we would continue to move. However, silver is likely to follow gold if gold continues down here, which again, this is kind of a natural thing. I think that if individuals are believing, if we're having this kind of frothy investor confidence, I can understand a lot of people that bought gold and silver or the market's going to naturally bid it down. But individuals that naturally bought gold and silver are feeling like, oh, why did I buy this gold and silver? I bought it because I was afraid. I'm going to go back into the stock market. We're going to go back to all-time highs. Another 10-year bull market. Let's go, baby. Uh, I would take advantage of their ignorance uh, if I were you. And again, as I've said, I'm going to continue to increase my physical holdings of gold and silver um, for the foreseeable future. That is at the number one top priority list of my Money Mondays now. Uh, platinum having a 
negative move down as well. Nothing to short here. So overall, uh, just kind of stand at the downside. Long on the corn CFD as well. Performing nicely today. Uh, overall, nothing strongly to report. All right, that's about all I got for that. Ooh, shoot. Coffee. Hmm. Eli, back. Thank you for the $5, my friend. Haven't seen you in a while. You are the shitcoin king, my brother. He says, hey, Justin. Wax Bitcoin pumped yesterday. Seems to be still trending bullish can I get your perspective on it? Of course, this man came in here and said, yeah, man, super long on, on wax, up 80%. You remind me of Fibonacci, right? You remind me of Fibonacci, right? Well, actually, I'd say Fibonacci reminds me about you. Uh, you come around when you got a banger trade. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, love you, my brother. Hopefully, you're killing it out there. Uh, let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at wax. I'm, not, I, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to have any strong opinions on it uh, as it is just a low kind of low liquidity shit coin that is that is being pumped to bejesus right now uh as it commonly is um yeah i mean you know these are the, these ones are these ones are kind of tough man like uh they're they're so man look i mean this just look at these books, man. I mean, this thing is so thin. You can see it's just been accumulated and accumulated and, and pumped. And all right. So just, just things that we can notice, right? Let's just look at the market, right? I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can. Um, we're at the rejection area. This is the area where wax has failed the last one, two, three, four times it's come up here. Uh, this time might be different. Um, but uh, I don't know. I don't know how I would position for something like this. Maybe a daily close above 800 and I would look for higher prices. Um, you know, massive, uh, you know, this, so this is, nobody really knows which way the market's going to go. Look at this massive doji candle. This indicates that you had a ton of, you had a ton of FOMO buying, um, in conjunction with a ton of profit taking selling, right? Uh, so now you just kind of have to be patient. I think whether there's going to be continuation to the upside here and there was enough FOMO buying to say, no, we're really going to go up here, uh, or whether this is it, uh, and the position buyers are out of this market and on to the next thing. And unfortunately, that's just ten that tends to be the way that I, I look at situations like this and coins like these and movements like these. Um, yeah, Mr. Ether saying sell buy uh, sell buy back in on the breakout. That is likely what I do. Uh, I would look at this as a profit taking opportunity and certainly secure some profits uh, with this kind of volatility. We don't know what we're going to see on the downside here if we do end up getting downside. And, uh, you know. Do you really want to give back another like 12% profit by setting a stop loss with the only metric that you have? Uh, what I would do is I would take 50% profit if you haven't already, and I'd set a trailing stop loss. Where would I set my trailing stop loss? 632 cents. Because that's what I do. Because that's what I do. Uh, if you wanted to increase risk, again, maybe 800 sats would be the level to watch for a breakout. Uh, maybe more conservative, maybe 850. Yep. 850, 800, 900, somewhere around there. That's a wide, that's a super wide range, but I would say 800. It would probably pay to be more aggressive than less aggressive on this one. Uh, and just keep your risk low, man. Like playing shitcoin breakouts, super high risk. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would take profit. I would, I would either take all my profit I would take, if it were me, I would take 50% profit and set my trailing stop loss at, I believe I said 632 sats. 632 sats. That's exactly what I do. And if I really liked this coin or for some reason I wanted to look to buy back in on the breakout, I would look for the daily close above 800. You might not be able to get that smooth, steady movement with daily closes. So watch, watch 800, maybe an hourly close or a four hour close, whatever's going to make you comfortable. At the end of the day, it's going to be higher risk than looking to buy a low on an altcoin and selling high. But congratulations, man. You continue to impress me with your ability to pick the best of the bunch. All right. Um, uh, what do we got? Not too much right now. 
Order flow is aggressively bullish. Um, yeah, a lot of buying on OKX. Interesting. Um, order flow is is uh, is pretty bullish right now, and we haven't seen heavy sell side come in yet. With that being said, let us get to today's uh, news for our crypto currently segment. Let's go. All right. Uh, actually, you know what? Hold on. Sorry, I did not set this up properly yet. Give us one moment and we will. No, 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 sell it, sell it all. Yeah, 3x leverage, all of it, sell all of it, yeah. No, they're, no, they're never going to, I've been telling them it was bullish, no, they're, they're never going to know. It's all good. The camera's on? I gotta go. Sorry, that was my, my dry cleaner. Um, all right, guys, uh, so. All right, now, uh, our first story of the day. Over at Grayscale, businesses, well, business, not multiple businesses, just one business. Business has been booming for Wall Street's go-to for Bitcoin exposure. All right, um, in a new interview, uh, Grayscale's head of investor relations, his name is Ray Sharif uh, Askri, uh, he revealed how hedge funds and other financial institutions have recently poured as much as $1.7 billion into Grayscale's Bitcoin and crypto funds, right? So there is a new episode of the Coin Scrum, I like that name, Market Podcast. Uh, and in this uh, interview, uh, Sharif discussed Grayscale soaring volumes and how the cryptocurrency broker and custody service provider now has almost $4 billion in total assets under management. And that's a huge jump because I believe they had 2.1 billion in May of 2019. And that is, and then it was 2.2 billion in early 2020, the last time we talked about this. 
But of course, we've seen this massive surge of retail interest over the last few months. All right, so, uh, yeah, sorry. So here's that, uh, here's the uh, Coin Scrum Markets podcast. Uh, we'll link this in the description down below if you guys want to give this a listen. Uh, and Grayscale's uh, Assets Under Management reports are here, okay, uh, are available on their website here if you're interested in taking a dive into these uh, numbers yourself, okay? Uh, but what their volume data reveals is that average weekly investment across all of Grayscale's different trusts, right? They have different trusts for different cryptos, has increased by about 800% over the past year, going from about $3.2 million per week that investors were allocating to trusts for, uh, managed by Grayscale to now about $30 million per week at this point in 2020. That is insane. So we have to ask, why is there this sudden surge in interest for Grayscale's offerings. We don't really have to ask. Come on, it's Bitcoin. They, they, they're scared about the market. They want to hold hard money, right? But uh, if we want to quote uh, Sharif himself, he says that 2020 has been a, you know, he said that 2020 was a year characterized, as we all know, by massive instability, macro instability, and th this, this unprecedented monetary stimulus, printing of money. This is debasement of the currency, right? And institutions are not blind to the vagaries of history, to the debasement of currency and what happens. This is late stage nation stuff uh, where, you know, war, famine and, and, and death tend to follow. Right. And what happens is the economy blows up and gold and so hard money comes back, which generally it was just gold and silver. But now we have Bitcoin. Hard money comes back and its value gets bid up to match the value of the overinflated economy. This has happened over and over and over and over and over again throughout history. And and hedge funds and institutions are no stranger to this, and they want hard money to weather the storm, right? You know, but it's been a record year for Grayscale, right? A record quarter for them, right? They've never seen demand like this ever before for their products, right? And a lot of their new clients are traditional hedge funds diversifying into cryptocurrency in a very, very big way, right? We've seen trickles earlier, but this is big. Big allocations are being made into cryptocurrency, right? Um, according to Grayscale and these reports, of the 90% of clients that come from institutions, half are multi-strategy hedge funds, uh, which a little bit more complicated than just the other portion, which is just uh, long short hedge funds, which hold concurrent positions and drop the losing leg off as market prices go up or down relative to whatever algorithm they're running. Uh, multi-strategy system, multi-strategy hedge funds can run high frequency trading bots. They can actually have proprietary desks where the traders actually uh, trade for them. And they direct traders to trade different commodities or different assets in different directions so that they are overall hedged. A lot of different ways. Uh, they can also engage in, I mean, just literally you name it, right? If, if, you, want to, if you want the avant-garde of, of experimental trading, it's uh, multi-strategy hedge funds, right? Now, uh, on the CoinScrum podcast, uh, Sharif was asked if investors are increasing their exposure to Grayscale's products through 401k plants, right? Which had previously been Grayscale's kind of promoted bread and butter project. Uh, since they opened their doors in 2013. And they said that, yes, you know, accounts, particularly those that are tax advantaged, uh, have always been and will continue to be the primary vehicle for high caliber investors. And the reason why is because that allows high caliber investors or high net worth individuals to invest in cryptocurrency without uh, having to custody it themselves, right? This is an issue for institutional investment into Bitcoin. They do not want to do self-custody. They want somebody to do that for them. And that is kind of anathema here in Bitcoin land, but that is just the way that it is. They want to own, they want to own an asset the same way that they would hold Apple stock. They, they have cash, they've got the money, they want to allocate it and have ownership in something, but they don't want to have to deal with security or ownership or privilege. And that's the way that things work in traditional, uh, in traditional land. So, uh, either, you know, there's got to, this is why custodial solutions and a lot of investment capital is being poured into this. And as much as we may not like that, and as much as we may know that not your keys, not your coins, I don't see this trend ending initially, but that's okay. Right. Jack pointed out some good things yesterday about, um, this Ameribor project, right. Which is looking to kind of replace it's blockchain based it's Ethereum blockchain based and looking to replace kind of the, uh, the LIBOR system, right. The interbank, um, the interbank interest rate system. So Jack pointed out yesterday that while it's not really the conversion from the banking sector that we deserve, maybe it's the conversion, the foot in the door that we need, right? To allow them to 
you know, like regular human beings or regular institutions, like slowly, gradually ease into something, right? Do you remember like when personal computers came out, how long did it take for them to be widespread in businesses? But yet to this day, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of IT professionals who as intelligent and skilled as they are, typically teach people how to use fax machines. Well, maybe printers nowadays, right? Or get QuickBooks to work. So technological progress is slow, right? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, investors, I think particularly in institutional investors and all investors really are looking to gain exposure to digital assets. Um, and as I said, with institutional investors, they want to do so in a way that doesn't mean that that means that they don't have to do self-custody, right? Now, over the past year, $390 million from these investors went into Bitcoin via Grayscale, while $110 million has gone into Ethereum, right? Also, when asked, he said that about 38% of their clients held more than just Bitcoin, which is up about 9% from this time last year. So st still, the majority of their clients are only interested in Bitcoin, but a little less than 40% of them are beginning to diversify. I would assume that of that, the majority of them just hold some Ethereum. Uh, and then I would say that the very smallest portion of that might hold some diversification of some other tokens that they offer. So uh, as for what she thinks is buying the unprecedented growth in investor interest, she said the policy implications of COVID-19, of course, right? You know, institutional investors are actively seeking scarce assets that could be used as a hedge against inflation in a world where we are being faced with unprecedented monetary stimulus. And, and by monetary stimulus, that is that means inflation of the currency supply, right? Debasement of the currency. That's what it means. That, 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 that's what it is. Uh, and because we do not really see any end to the economic turbulence in sight, their expectations, at least at grayscale, is that this investor interest is going to continue to ratchet up in the coming months. So maybe the best possible year on record ever, meaning that, uh, you know, good time. Good time to be involved with uh good time to be involved with grayscale all right um next story of the day of course a new report has been published by the philadelphia branch the philadelphia the philadelphia branch of the united states federal reserve banking system and in it they warn the issuance of central bank digital currencies they warn about the issuance of central bank digital currencies you know talking about the negative spillover effects that that would have uh, in commercial banking, right? And Uh, what is this? Nice. Esports arena, qualified traders all over the world. TIO markets. We will not fade into the night. You guys, go check them out. Maybe we'll sponsor. Uh, maybe we'll sponsor uh, Don Candon for the 2020 Trading Cup. All right. Anyway, sorry. Getting back to what we were talking about. I forget the Philly Fed. Uh, as we know, last month, uh, the uh, not last month. It was like what? Just earlier. It's like last week, right? Goldman Sachs came out with what became an extremely memeable uh, negative take on uh, Bitcoin, as we know. And, uh, you know, we slammed them. Uh, it, everybody slammed them. It was just this completely memeable thing. Uh, we even covered it on a Breaking Bitcoin Bits segment, which you guys can check out. We'll drop the link to the description down this in the area down below. But uh, nice, scathing report on that has come out today. So it's good to see some... Uh, it's good to see some uh, some contrariness, some contrariness uh, in the world, uh, at least against their their report coming from the other world of traditional. Right. Uh, so Chris Thomas, he's the head of digital assets at Swiss Quote Bank. 
And he argued that Bitcoin's volatility is normal for an infant market and should be considered in a diversified portfolio. Who are you calling an infant, sir? But again, of course, this is just kind of their, their main thing. Like Goldman Sachs talked about the fact that it has no intrinsic value. Obviously, it does have intrinsic value. JP Morgan even says it has intrinsic value. Eh. Um, and, you know, just every it seems like everybody around the world understands that Goldman Sachs got this completely wrong when they essentially advised all of their investors that one should have no exposure to Bitcoin, like none, like not one percent, like you can't give us like the one percent. So, again, one could argue that, hey, that's their stance. They're allowed to do that. They're just ultra conservative, whatever. That's totally fine. But uh, at the end of the day. Cannot cannot miss an opportunity to uh, to dump on them. Uh, anyways, you guys, let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Moving forward, uh, let's hop over into the charts real quick and check price. All right, cool. I see that order's doing well. I'm just kidding, guys. I'm long, right? Uh, let's see here. Uh, let me check the, um, let me just check the, oh, oh I know what I want to do uh, because I have been forgetting to do this recently. Uh, let us reward our viewers over there on DLive. Let's distribute these rewards. Much love to you guys. Thank you for all the support. If you guys are watching over on YouTube and you have not yet, please subscribe to the channel. It does help us out. Get the word out there. You got to hit the bell icon, though, if you want to be notified. You're just not, you're, they're not going to get you notifications. Uh, like goal, 50 likes. We can get there, guys. Beautiful, beautiful Friday today, June 5th. Thunderstormed out here last night. Uh, and um, yeah, it's good for my tomatoes. So... Um, yeah, let's see if we can hit that 50 like goal. Moving into easy, breezy Friday. Profit-taking day. Um, and an interesting weekend. You know, I, I really want you guys to take some time. This is what I'm going to do. Like, you know, just, just consolidate your thoughts over the weekend. Figure out what your fundamental position on Bitcoin is. If you're on the fence, that's totally fine. If you're incredibly bullish, that's totally fine. If you're incredibly bearish, I don't know what's wrong with you um, when it comes to Bitcoin. And, you know, make the conviction over the weekend to carry forth on Monday when the market opens back up with the same objectivity that you have been putting in previously. And if you have not been putting in objectivity, if you've been trading with your gut and been getting it wrong, kind of make that commitment to become more objective and be far more careful in calculating in your decisions. And also decide at this kind of critical juncture, right? Moving forward, what side of history do you wanna be on, right? Do you want to be completely exposed to the equity markets? with all of its ups, ups and swings, even if we go on another bullish run, mini bullish run or macro bullish run? Or are you kind of dedicated to spending the next five to 10 years, if it, if need be, uh, accumulating the hard currency that you're going to need to survive a further downfall? Or do you not want anything to do with that and you just want to make some money on the side? That's fine. Come learn to trade. Join us in the Discord. Um, but I think it's important, right? You cannot move forward uh, if you do not know you cannot make intelligent decisions. You cannot make informed decisions if you do not act from a base of conviction. There reaches a point in your life where you develop who you are. You, you've developed who you are as a person. You've come to believe the things that you believe. And you are either going to act on your beliefs with conviction or you go into public education uh, or, uh, or politics. All right, uh, big winners over here on DLive. Rhino TD, Squeaky Tad, Pull, Dark Rico, The Pie Guy, and Ricky T. Thank you guys so much for the continued support, my friends. Hopefully you guys are crushing it today. And over on the tube of you. Uh, Don Candon asking if I can look at the chips to beer ticker. Uh, I actually think, so just, it literally, it just kind of depends on Kind of depends on how much you've drank, really. Like, you know, the right the proper ratio of chips to beer is uh it's important, you know. And the inputs matter, right? So uh, you know, depends on on how you're trading it. Uh I would certainly be using indicators and not trend lines though.
Yeah, you make a good point, challenged investor. You know, the 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 toll has not really come in yet on um like the amount of damage that's been done across the country. The looting, the job loss, the rioting, commercial real estate. Yeah, you make a good point. Let's do a um let me see if I can pull something up here. Just give me a second. All right. Um, yeah, I guess I wanted to show this. Yeah, and, and, and honestly, just, just give him a big shout out. So this is Senior Analyst Alexander's uh, Trading Journal. And just doing an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, obviously, um, at the beginning of the month, uh, actually a little bit, uh, must have been about two weeks ago now, yeah, toward the end of May, you know, Alexander made the decision to step up uh, and take, uh, take on the responsibility of... Uh, coordinating the cryptocurrency signals market and you know in conjunction with his own personal trading and he has done an absolutely fantastic job you know uh he you know alex is aggressive uh he is intuitive and he is is doing fantastic so like i said i i mean he is certainly outperforming me uh this month you know he had and and because of his aggression right this is i kind of want to point this out right because of his aggression, like he closed last month in the red, but all of that was necessary because he was aggressive and that led to him being able to get into and hold some of these fantastic positions that he's allowed to run. You know, so all of the loss that he, uh, he, he incurred loss at a specific time period, right? Uh, and that was last month. And that set him up for a beautiful beginning of this month. Really, honestly, a lot of these trades, or at least the ones on the top, were opened up last month in concurrence with the losing trade. So if he would have just happened, to, if he would have had these results last month, he would have closed out positively. So I just want to give a big shout out to him. He's doing fantastic work. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just been my pleasure and honor to to mentor him uh, and have him uh, see him grow as, a, as an individual and a trader. Uh, and again, he is kicking my butt. Uh, because I've been quite conservative, uh, so this is me. Obviously, my open positions are uh, nice, uh, but you know, and this is this is quite respectable for me. Uh, but being relatively conservative for the uh, beginning of June, <laughs> being relatively conservative for the beginning month of June, I uh, didn't take on a lot of forex risk, just letting my winners run. Uh, as you can see here, the CAD, for example, and the Kiwi dollar up almost uh, up about on an average of 6% on both of those, which is insane gains for Forex trades. Uh, and then again, a lot of ETF exposure with uh, 10 and uh, uh, 10 and uh, aluminum. I don't want to talk about Tyson. Uh, and then, of course, the, ex the exposure that I've put on. But again, I've been averaging... Uh, pretty good, consistent uh, ROI gains. So that's what I look at. I look at how much of total equity did I make. Um, and uh, it feels like, well, for 2019 was was an incredible year for me uh, where I was averaging about 20%. Uh, not every single month, but it you know, just averaged out because I certainly had overperforming months. And that is because I'm very aggressive on going spot long with BTC. So I get rapid acceleration with leverage of my net worth of my actual trading equity when everything aligns, right? Unfortunately, and as I've told people, right, 
when we enter into periods of chop, I can incur drawdown. That is a pain in the ass. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. Um... Uh, but that's okay. Like I said, I'm working heavily on the new educational material for July. And although I have had some time over the last few days to trade the lower time frames a little bit more and guide the members on how I look at sentiment and market structure and things of that nature, um, I'll have more time for that. I'm probably going to, I'm going to have to pause on that because I'm getting, I've written a lot of scripts and done a lot of work and prepared the material. Uh, over the next few weeks, I will be recording more educational material more heavily in preparation for us transitioning everything to the Online Trading Academy on the website. Uh, and I'm pretty excited about that. You guys will be able to see the web pages for those pretty soon. Uh, but overall, up about almost 4% in actual ROI so far on the entire month. Well, actually about 5 because I've got about 2% realized ROI in dollars and 3.75% unrealized in U.S. dollars. So that's BTC converted to USD and backwards and flipped around. So overall, things are well. With that being said, guys, honestly, uh, it is Friday. It is 1.12. I apologize, but I have a ton, a ton of, stu ton of stuff I need to f uh, finish for the group uh, before the weekend ends. And of course, I've got to close out uh, traditional and Forex and CFD trades as well in their appropriate time slots. I have a mentoring session at 4 o'clock uh, and I have a few meetings in between there. So... I want to get some of that work done, maybe even fix Don Candon's uh, bug in Watatar Explosion and um, and all of this stuff. So with that being said, guys, let's, let's transition. I want to thank you guys so much for joining me for today's Friday's episode of Breaking Bitcoin Market Update brought to you, as always, by the Cracking Cryptocurrency Premium Trading Group. More information in the description down below if you're interested in improving your trading results. <sighs> We will be back on Monday at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time for another episode to break down the markets, provide our news, rant a little bit at the skies, and make fun of, um, you know, whoever happens to be in the spotlight that day. Uh, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, sarcastic remarks, or death threats, you can leave them in the comment section down below. We do respond to you uh, pretty much all the time. Uh, join us in the Discord. Discord.crackingcryptocurrency is the place to be. Uh, it's a great free resource and tool that you get in uh, communication with whoever you want to talk to, uh, whether your interest is in technical analysis or in the memes or in Pine or in strategy building. You'll find what you need there. It's a fantastic hub. Um, as I said, moving into the weekend, you know, take some time to reflect and get a strong, you know, get a good get a firm grasp. Maybe you haven't thought about it. Maybe you do think about it and you've got the answer, right? Uh, but if you haven't, if you do not really know where you sit from a conviction basis, from a fundamental basis, like on what side of history you want to be with regards to your investments and with the economy and with hard money versus soft money, take some time. Think about it. Do your research. You know, don't just listen to me. Don't just listen to the news. Do your own research, make your own results, and act from a place of conviction. And be willing to be right or be wrong. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, you'll have made the decision that was right for you. Not the decision that was made for you. And that can mean all the difference. Because human beings need meaning in their lives. Uh, links are down in the description for anything you guys could possibly need. Whether they're exchanges to trade on or services you would like to try. Uh, and as I said, we'll be back on Monday for another episode of Breaking Bitcoin Market Update. Until then, have a fantastic weekend. Trade safely, build some trading systems, be excellent to one another, and trade safely as always. Cheers, guys.